Before we start this video, I want to give a massive shout out to the patrons on the screen right now. You guys are truly awesome. And if anyone else wants to support me, I will leave the link in the video description. Umidigi, the Shenzhen-centered smartphone maker, have a five-year history of making devices closer to the budget end of the market, but usually with some kind of design twist, such as the Crystal's minimal three-quarter bezels. But there's only one really rather interesting phone in their portfolio that blurs the lines between budget, premium, and straight-up copycat. Hey guys, my name's Ryan Thomas for Failtech, and thanks to a wonderful Damien Wilde, today we're going to be taking a look at the Umidigi Z2. Let's talk about the most distinct design decision that Umi made here, that color scheme on the back. It's called Aurora and it's possibly the shiniest back I have ever experienced on a phone. It's fade between purple and green reminded me of a certain other Chinese smartphone, but done in a much simpler way with a metallic sheen to it that just makes it stand out in a crowd of black and white smartphones. Since I like having the cameras in the center at the top, like on Samsung's, I welcome this layout with the fingerprint scanner. However, what bothers me is the fact that the circles are all different sizes and that scanner is almost impossible to discern from the rest of the back due to just how shallow the gap is. The curved metal edges make the phone super comfortable to hold and the gradual taper and transition in materials makes the phone hard to tell apart from a more premium offering in just the ergonomics. The thing is though, that glass coating, whatever they've put on it, makes the phone feel incredibly slippery. I mean, this is probably one of, if not the most slippery smartphone that I've used in the past half decade. The buttons placed on the right side are in my favorite order and are just tactile enough, but are actually pretty loose and you can hear them rattle and move around, which isn't great. And whilst talking of exterior features, that lack of a headphone port in a phone of this price range is just inexcusable. On flagships, I've kind of stopped caring about the headphone port. It's really nice to have one, but I don't care too much. But on a phone of this caliber, where all of its competitors are having a headphone port, and also in a market where more people are using wired headphones, it kind of seems silly to leave it out. And whilst I can attest to the solid feeling in the hand, the lack of weather resistance is concerning to me personally, living in the wonderful UK. Flipping over to the front, we get a look at the very Pocophone-esque front panel. Although this time the bezels are considerably smaller, providing a much nicer look and, funny enough, a more ergonomic experience. The chin is surprisingly small on this thing, but of course we do have the larger notch up at the top. It's not the worst implementation though, and I definitely wouldn't call it offensively ugly. The display itself is about what the Poco phone has, so nothing special. But here in the UK at least, it's 25% cheaper, so I'd expect that. It features an IPS display with rounded corners and a clearly less cheap implementation than the Poco phone had. I'm definitely not getting as much shadowing or as much distortion as the Poco phone's display, but I do get a little bit. Colors are good, viewing angles are okay, and the pixel response times are actually quite good, but the shadowing and color accuracy could definitely be improved. It gets decently bright, but the thing is it doesn't get very dim. And whilst that might sound silly, when you're in bed and you've got to wake up to check your notifications, you're gonna get blinded by this thing. It's something I used to complain about a lot with older Samsungs, but these days it's more IPS driven. It's definitely sharp enough being wide full HD and watching YouTube videos is doable, more than doable actually. Since the front panel looks good, but then this is the kicker, the single speaker on the bottom is possibly the worst speaker I've ever used on a smartphone. It's tinny, it's muffled, it's unclear. It's just a really bad speaker overall. I wouldn't have minded having a bottom firing speaker if it was a semi-decent one, but no. And it's not a good experience, but when you don't even get a headphone port either, things aren't looking good. Oh, and the YouTube full screening thing is just shoddy to say the least. Just look how weirdly it's cut off on one side and how rounded it is on the other. It just, it just doesn't work very well. Shifting gears to performance for a brief second, we get to see why this phone costs what it does. It's use of a MediaTek chip. In particular, a Helio P23, along with six gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage. It's not the fastest thing in the world. It'll 
run 2D games absolutely fine, and if you're an avid Words With Friends player, then this thing is right up your alley. But for real racing or PUBG, you're just gonna experience a lot of lag, and the P23 doesn't offer the horsepower to drive it. In everyday tasks like browsing social media, it's good. In fact, it's more than good. It's probably more than enough for the general market of this thing. But it's only when you really go into power using your phone, such as really quickly switching between applications, multitasking, using the camera a lot, anything like that, you do feel a stutter. And it's not just like a, an, a little stutter, a little hiccup, but it can kind of hold the phone in a position for about two seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot when you're using the thing. It really does cut up what would usually be a normal good experience. I haven't used a phone in a little while that's hiccuped as much as this one. And yes, it's a lower price, but you can get a Galaxy S7 that does much less hanging than this and is a little bit cheaper. The problem lies in the lies in UmiDigi's marketing material. Sure, the Z2's ROM might be based on stock Android, but you do get a nice dose of bloat installed by default and some of the UI elements just don't fit properly. It's almost like a deceiving cover up for a poor backend. Either way, don't expect software updates like at all, although there are some ROMs available, including AOSP, so that might be worth a try. Don't expect anything magical from the camera either, or that one, or that one, or that one. They are subpar in pretty much every way. The camera app itself is buggy and crashy, it looks and feels awful, and even third-party applications are a little bit dodgy with it. Results in anything other than perfect light are pretty poor, and even in good light, yeah, there are better options on the market. This probably has to be the largest corner cut of all, and the poker mode is literally just a blurry vignette. So for any budding photographers, I severely recommend you leave this one and go for something a bit better, even in the U segment, and images just look soft. Video recording modes include 1080p and 720. Yep, that's it, I'll be honest, it's getting boring talking about these cameras because they're literally just that bad, and the experience is just as bad. On paper, the cameras don't look too bad in specification, but when you actually use them, you realize just how bad they can be. Battery life and feature set, both very good on this smartphone. We get an almost 4,000 mAh battery and a form of 18 watt fast charging. Okay, we do miss out on wireless charging, but that's kind of a given when you look at the price tag. The thing with this phone is it's lasted me a full day every single day since I got it. And sometimes it would bleed into the next day and I would only have to charge it at lunchtime. Now, I'm not saying this battery is huge by any means because it's really not. It's nowhere near the 4,000 mAh that I found in the Poco phone, but what it does offer is like better battery life than you would expect, whether that's due to an underpowered system on a chip, or maybe it's due to the fact that because it's so slow, I don't want to use it as much. Either way, my typical schedule is to just go through Twitter three, four, five times a minute. Then I'll check Instagram and I'll check Social Blade, and I will watch a video here and there, but due to the speaker, I tend to not want to do that. And with all of that, it still manages to get me through a full day every single time. And the charging isn't slow. The battery is probably one of the best parts of the smartphone. We get N Wi-Fi radios in the Z2, meaning that Wi-Fi is significantly capped compared to many others, and 4G signal seemed to cut off more than even the Poco phone did for me. When a used phone in the, this price range, such as the iPhone 7, would keep a solid signal, it kind of makes you worry. Dual 4G SIM slots are super handy, and if you can do without that second SIM, you get microSD too, which is what I think most, if not all budget smartphones should have. MicroSD is a godsend when transferring media and when switching between phones. The fingerprint scanner, whilst placed well, is marvelously unresponsive, and it just feels like first gen hardware. It works sometimes, but not enough to call it a good scanner, and it takes multiple tries just to unlock, and just plainly isn't good enough. Overall, this smartphone is pretty hard to recommend to anyone, and there are several reasons why. One is that at this price range, there are so many better options in several different markets, different categories, different sizes, and I think you're just better off going with a Snapdragon or Exynos powered device, because MediaTek, eh, is pretty cheap. On paper, this thing looks to be pretty good. You know, it's got the six gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of storage, dual cameras front and back, a decent battery. There are plenty of good things to see in this phone on paper, but it's only when you use it that you realize that, wow, specs don't matter. I wonder where I got that saying from. The caveat is that this smartphone is possibly one of the best built smartphones that I've used in a long time. It feels incredibly premium. It's shiny, it's glossy, it feels like it's not gonna break when I drop it. It's, it's just crazy. 
yet the internals are so underpowered. And I think that's just a big metaphor for the big tech world that we've got right now. Advertising big specs and not necessarily delivering on the promises of speed, that's a problem that we seem to face a lot more in the tech world than we ever have done. Great build quality, great battery life, and a decent screen, but let down by poor stability, poor performance, and some cameras that I actually think are worse than the ones found in the Nintendo DSi. But you know what, it's still gonna be my daily driver because Damien gave it to me and uh, oh my God, thank you so much. I've actually got a phone now. So even though I've given it a bad review, I'm gonna continue to use it pretty much every day because it's the only phone I have and honestly, I'm very grateful for it. I wanna give a massive shout out to Damien Wild, the man who let me use this phone and I, I believe has given or lent it, I'm not sure which one uh, to me to use for a long time. I am going to be reviewing some more phones that he will be sending, so more shout outs for him. He's an absolute legend, he's got his own YouTube channel, I do recommend you go and check that out because he's been posting some good stuff on there and I believe he's got some good stuff to come up as well. Anyway guys, that's about it from me. Thank you all so much for watching, please do like, dislike, comment and subscribe if you're new around to send me a video like this one. Also check out my social media, links will all be in the video description as always. I want to give a massive shout out to my patrons, again you guys are awesome. And I want to give a massive shout out to my Discord, as well as my YouTube streams which I've been doing on the Flat4K channel. Anyway guys, my name is Ryan Thomas for Feltech, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.